so do I have to do any more? No, I'm I'm in. I'm recording, and uh, you, you are, are recording now. Yeah. Good. Okay. Because there was another thing there that said uh, about uh, allowing recording. Good. Again, I can I completely apologize for my ne uh, technophobia in this, but good. Uh, so you are recording. And uh, I did talk uh, to another of your classmates, and the issue uh, was that if I do this on Blackboard, I have to do some massive uh, combination of the two sections of this. And right now, I just don't know how to do that. But I'm mm. going to try to find out that, and then if I can, I would then use these things on Blackboard. But well. at this point, at this point, I'm going to start to move into uh, doing um, uh, lecture two, which is on the ventricular system. And again, like I said, we will either synchronously or asynchronously review through all of these um, other slides. So in these next two little mini lectures that I'm doing here, is uh, uh, one is on the ventricular system and one is on the blood supply. And the whole idea in, this, uh, in, this, in these lectures is to amalgamate what we did about uh, uh, gross uh, uh, neuroanatomy and, um, and um, how these things connect in with the ventricular system and then how the blood supply is connected. So uh, as you know, in my uh, initial lectures, I basically uh, identified the ventricular system as we were looking at it. And I tried to point out, at least when we went through the gross anatomy and look at, looked at the sulci, looking at uh, various places where the blood supply would come in. So uh, these two, the, uh, we have another person to be admitted. Let me admit them. There we go. Since, since I'm co-host, um, Richard, uh, since I'm co-host, I can do that each time without you having to stop. I'm sorry, say that again? Since I'm co-host, you don't need to stop when you see that. I'll just click them in. Oh, thank you. Okay. So now we'll sort of move, it'll move along. So uh, I think there's a, a little uh, uh, diagram of uh, the, the ventricular system is an, an interesting diagram because it sort of uh, uh, calls up uh, the wonderful artist, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, looking at a sort of New, Mexi New Mexico motif of, uh, of like a, 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 a skull of a bovine. But very much, um, this is basically what we're going to be looking at the whole ventricular system, which of course is made up of the two lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, a thing called the aqueduct of Sylvius, and then the fourth ventricle, and then how they are connected and how they basically work. So, okay, let me just click this and here we go, oh, there we go. So, so here we're basically going to be looking at the base of the skull and the cranial nerve exits and then the venous sinuses and uh, then the tubicinarium. Um, and we'll be identifying this. Uh, so here is a base of a skull. And basically what you're looking at is uh, a whole uh, a number of the places where uh, blood is either coming in or leaving. And of course, um, for the brain, the largest amount of, of venous blood is going to be running out of the jugular vein. But an enormous amount of the blood is uh, found in what you call the venous sinuses. Now, the other thing that's just important right here is that what we can see right here and right here is the left and the right internal carotid, which is going to be a major uh, source of the arterial blood that's coming in. 
And that becomes important um, when we start to consider the, um, uh, the ventricular system. The other thing that we have to basically understand is that the brain is encased in a series of three outer brain membranes. And the way I have it listed here is we have it listed from the outermost to the innermost. So uh, the outer brain, the most outer brain mem uh, membrane is dura matter. And dura matter is extremely thick. It's a very uh, multicellular and whatever. And it literally surrounds and encases the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, basically, I think the easiest way to think of, a, of the dura matter and its thickness and its elasticity and toughness is basically if you ever played softball and you knock the, uh, knock the outer covering of the softball off and you just basically felt that. Dura matter is very much like that. Now, uh, between the dura matter and the next layer, the arachnoid matter, there is a layer between these two membranes. It is called the periosteal layer. And within the periosteal layer lie the venous sinuses. Okay? So, so now we get to the next layer, which is the arachnoid matter. And the arachnoid matter, matter is thin and non-vascular. And basically, whereas the dura matter sits very loosely around uh, the brain and spinal cord, the arachnoid matter uh, is much closer to the, uh, 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 the brain, but it passes over the sulci. Okay, it doesn't go within the cell side. So now there is yet another space between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. And that space is called the subarachnoid space. So notice if you look at the space between the dura matter and the arachnoid matter, the periosteal layer, what you have are the venous sinuses. You have blood. You have uh, blood containing uh, uh, carbon dioxide, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the space between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter, the subarachnoid space, contains CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. Then the uh, last of the outer brain membranes in the innermost is called the pia matter. And they are only a few cells thickness and they literally follow the whole contours of the sulci and the gyri. And they are divided into what is called intima pia and the epipeal layers. So those are the three uh, layers. And the important thing to recognize in that is that whereas the subarachnoid space contains cerebrospinal fluid, the outer periosteal layer contains the venous sinuses. So of course, a big question is going to be, how does um, CSF that's in the subarachnoid space get into, okay, let me admit this guy, there we go. Uh, how does it get into the venous sinuses? Because what we're going to have is a system where we're continually producing CSF and therefore, what we need to do is take CSF that is circulated and move it back into the venous uh, system. So we'll basically look at that. And then we'll look at a number of anomalies where all of a sudden this doesn't happen. So here is a wonderful sort of uh, picture looking at the meningeal layers of the brain. And what you can basically see is on the right, what you're doing is you're, you're seeing dura matter. So you see that dura matter basically covers uh, the skull and its thickness obfuscates the gyri and the sulci. Whereas on the left, what you're looking is at the brain with the arachnoid matter 
uh, sort of covering uh, those sulci and gyri. Is the arachnoid okay. question? What's that? Uh, the arachnoid matter is it those like thin stringy bits going through the sulci? Well, the arachnoid matter is a couple of uh, 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 layers of cells thick, and it just sort of covers the brain. It doesn't go into the sulci, whereas oh, so the pia matter follows that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. So the major thing we want to talk about is cerebrospinal fluid, a CSF, and cerebrospinal fluid in an average brain is about a total of about 140 milliliters of this clear liquid and 25 milliliters are found in the ventricles. So that means that a vast majority of it is going to be found outside of the ventricles and we're gonna see how it gets outside and exactly where it is. That, so that remaining 115 ml is going to be sitting in the subarachnoid space, and we'll see how it gets there. So, if it's sitting in the subarachnoid space, um, that cerebrospinal fluid serves as an excellent buffer from trauma, you know, hitting yourself in the head and whatever. It also, the CSF, is extremely nutritive. It's high in protein, glucose, and Meta and, met and electrolytes. Now, where, what is the source of the CSF? The CSF comes, it, it is produced by epithelial cells of something called the choroid plexus. Now, where is the, so what does choroid plexus basically mean? It means a very dense interconnections of 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, a, a sort of lattice work that can be found on the floor of the lateral ventricles and the roof of the third ventricle, and literally, what is happening? What we're going to see pretty soon when we talk about the blood supply is the two major arteries that come in and feed the choroid plexus, this epithelial cell, and these epithelial cells, is going to be the anterior choroidal artery and the posterior choroidal artery, okay? And we'll get back to that when I, uh, when, uh, uh, when, this new CSF is being continuously produced on the floor of the lateral ventricles and the roof of the third ventricle. What, so what should that tell you? What that should basically tell you is that the new CSF is being produced and then pushes the existing CSF downward. So you're gonna have the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle flowing into the cerebral aqueduct, flowing into the fourth ventricle, and then eventually flowing into the subarachnoid space. And I will describe exactly how that happens. Now, what you can appreciate is how, uh, uh, how much we produce in a day. So if you notice, we have 140 ml of the CSF, yet over a given day, we produce 600 to 700 milliliters per day. So basically what is happening is if we have a system that does not allow us to let the old CSF go, literally our brains will explode, okay? Almost like one of those, I always remember 1980s um, a science fiction movie called Scanners in which people's heads would explode. But in any way, that's how I think. So it's gonna be very important that we have exit points for the CSF because we're producing 700 milliliters per day and 140, and 140 milliliters of CSF. And this produces a pressure. So it's 100 to 150 millimeters prone, 200 to 300 millimeters sit, sitting. So literally 
the CSF is, can, as we're all sitting here in this lecture, the CSF is pushing um, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the CSF through the lateral and third ventricles into the cerebral aqueduct, into the fourth ventricle, and then into the subarachnoid space. So here is a nice little schematic drawing of it. So what you can basically see is here is a lateral ventricle, and this would be where the choroid plexus is, and it'd be either on the floor of the lateral ventricle or on the roof of the third ventricle. And therefore, any CSF would basically flow through uh, the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle, and then what now is gonna happen? Well, what you need are a, a couple of very important types of exit points. So number one, I pointed out that there's two lateral ventricles that is producing the CSF. And on the roof of the third ventricle, there is, um, there, uh, uh, you're producing CSF. And there is an opening between the two lateral ventricles going into the third ventricle. And the term that we use, just like we used the term when we talked about the cranial nerves, that there is an opening or a foramen, F-O-R-A-M-E-N, that is found between the left and right lateral ventricles and the third ventricle. The name of that foramen is the foramen of Monroe. M-O-N-R-O. -O. So now the CSF would be flowing uh, out of the uh, lateral ventricles through the foramen of Monroe into the third ventricle, into the cerebral aqueduct, into the fourth ventricle. So now there is, uh, when you get to the back of the fourth ventricle, there are only four possibilities where the CSF can go. One possibility is it can still stay in the central nervous system. That is some of the CSF flows from the fourth ventricle down into uh, that ventricular component of the spinal cord. That is called the central canal. So some of the CSF will go down into the central canal. Then the other, uh, there are three other exits for the CSF to exit. And, and um, let me go back. Uh, one, one is a medial exit, a medial aperture called the foramen of Majan D, M A. G-E-N-D-I-E. -E. Then there are two lateral um, exits, and they are called the foramina, plural, of Lushka, L-U-S-C-H-K-A. And a nice sort of mnemonic to remember is that the medial uh, uh, aperture is named for Majan D-M-M, and the two lateral apertures are the, um, the uh, uh, foramen of Rablushka, L for lateral. So in any case, these three apertures or foramina of Majan D and Lushka allow the CSF to exit the fourth ventricle and go into the subarachnoid space. So now, Let's start to examine the lateral ventricles in a little more detail. So first of all, the two lateral ventricles. Remember that the two lateral ventricles, what you automatically learn is if you see a lateral ventricle, you must therefore be in the telencephalon, the most rostral of the encephalic structures. And the two ventricles, if you remember when we looked at the medial surface of the brain and we saw the 
the corpus callosum up on the uh, 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 shoot on the roof of the lateral ventricle and the fornix on the floor of the lateral ventricle. We ha I, I described a very thin membrane that separates the left lateral ventricle and the right lateral ventricle. That membrane is called the septum pellucidum. So if we basically think of the ventricles as a room, the ceiling would be the core, uh, the, uh, the ceiling, uh, uh, the ceiling would be the corpus callosum, the floor would be the fornix, the medial portion of the room is the septum pellucidum, and then the, uh, uh, a structure that can be invariably found on the lateral surface of the lateral ventricles is a basal ganglia structure called the caudate nucleus, C-A-U-D-A-T-E. And this caudate nucleus, one of the things that we can think of it, again, another, another analogy, is to basically think of a tadpole. But think of a tadpole in that wonderful 30-year uh, animated series called The Simpsons. Because remember, in The Simpsons, what they have is uh, they buy a nuclear power plant and they show you fish that have two heads and everything like that. The tadpole we would see in this little analogy is a cordial that has a big head in the telencephalon, a, 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 a more streamlined body when we get into the uh, parietal lobe. And then we would then have um, two tails in the occipital and temporal lobes. So what I'm gonna now do is take the four major lobes of the brain that we looked at in the first couple of lectures the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe, and describe both the lateral ventricles and describe the chordae. So in the frontal lobe, you are in the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. It's big, it's the largest, it's the widest. Then in the parietal lobes, you're in the body of the lateral ventricle. Then, in the occipital and temporal lobes, you're in the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle and the inferior horn. These horn, so-called horns are a lot thinner than what you see for the anterior horn. So now if we're following the chordate nucleus, what we're gonna see on the lateral surface of the anterior horn is the head of the chordate nucleus. When we are looking at the uh, body of the lateral ventricle, we're gonna be seeing the body of the chordate. And then when we're either in the posterior horn or inferior horn in the occipital and temporal lobes, we're basically gonna see the tail of the chordate nucleus. And this will become very important when we're looking as we slice through the brain and look at it through all of these structures. So the lateral ventricles here, I'm talking to you on two different levels. One, of course, is a functional level as to why is there a lateral ventricle? What does it have? What does it do? But the second, and I think equally important thing for you to uh, understand here is to basically look at the lateral ventricles as landmarks. And again, given the size of the lateral ventricles that uh, basically encompass that whole telencephalon, what you then want to do is you want to subdivide the lateral ventricles into the anterior horn, into the body, into the posterior horn, and the inferior horn. So if you remember when we took that very large area of the inferior frontal gyrus, we divided it then into three parts, a pars opercularis, a pars uh, triangularis, and a pars orbitalis. Here, we're taking the lateral ventricles 
and talk about the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle, frontal lobe, body of the lateral ventricle, parietal lobe, posterior horn of the lateral ventricle, occipital lobe, inferior horn of the lateral ventricle, temporal lobe. Okay? Does everybody uh, sort of understand that? So here again, we're looking at just the diagrammatic structure. So what you can basically see right here is this would be the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle because where are we sitting? We're basically sitting in the frontal lobe. Here's your central sulcus, right? So this is the anterior horn. The body of the lateral ventricle, what we can see right here is the, uh, in the parietal lobe. Then what we see is a posterior horn of the lateral ventricle, uh, which of course is in the occipital lobe. And then what we have is an inferior horn of the lateral ventricle, which you can see is embedded within the um, uh, temporal lobe. And in all of the cases here, all through the uh, uh, anterior body, posterior horn, and inferior horn, we have the choroid plexus and the epithelial cells that are producing CSF. And eventually, what they are going, uh, each of the lateral ventricles is going to exit uh, 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 the lateral ventricle through the foramen of Monroe, you see the intraventricular foramen of Monroe, into the third ventricle. And again, the third ventricle is going to have uh, the roof of the third ventricle producing yet more CSF, okay? So now let's look at the other ventricles. So we saw the foramen of Monroe is the opening between the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle. And once we get into the brain and look at it, we will actually see this there. So now we have CSF running into the third ventricle. And now the third ventricle is found in the diencephalon which is again, another reason why I talked about encephalic development. Now, whereas the lateral ventricles have that horn-shaped structure, the third ventricle, it's singular, is vertically aligned. And it literally divides the left hypothalamus from the right hypothalamus, okay? So the third ventricle, is found in the diencephalon, it's vertically aligned, and it's found right along the midline between the left and right hypothalamus. Then the third ventricle eventually flows into the cerebral aqueduct. And of course, when we talked about gross anatomy, we basically looked at the midbrain and we realized that the midbrain was the place where we could basically define uh, a, a so-called roof tectum and a so-called floor tegmentum. And the thing that separates the tectal portion of the midbrain and the tegmental portion of the midbrain is the ventricular part, the aqueduct of Sylvius or cerebral aqueduct. Notice our friend Sylvius now has named two major things, the cerebral aqueduct, and they also named the lateral sulcus, or those things are named after them. So then the CSF is now flowing from the lateral ventricles and the third ventricles through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. And the fourth ventricle is in the metencephalic and myelencephalic parts of the brain, also the pontine and, med, med, uh, and medulla. And whereas the third ventricle is vertically aligned and the cerebral aqueduct looks like a little keyhole, the fourth ventricle is horizontally aligned. And the roof of the fourth ventricle, 
is going to be the cerebellum, whereas the floor of the fourth ventricle is going to be the whole pons and medulla. So whereas in the midbrain, the cerebral aqueduct the, divides the superior portion of the midbrain, the tectum, from the inferior portion of the midbrain, the uh, tegmentum, the whole pons and medulla just is known as tegmentum. Okay. So now, now we look at the four uh, CNS ventricular exits. And I mentioned this before. So here the CSF, which is being produced at almost four times the daily rate of what the whole um, uh, uh, ventricular system holds and the subarachnoid space holds, the way that this uh, CSF is now going to escape out of the brain is a small portion of it will directly enter the central canal. And then it escapes through a medial aperture into the foramen of Majandi, and then through two lateral apertures, the foramina of Lushka. Now, this, this CSF is exiting into something called the cisterna magna. And what is a, cis a cistern? A cistern is a well or a place where you keep fluid and Magna is large. Where is the cisterna magna? I want everybody to feel. Reach, be, take your finger, reach be, behind your skull, and press into the back of your neck. You feel that uh, sort of indentation there. That's exactly where your cisterna magna is. So the cisterna magna or more formally known as the cerebellomedullary cistern, is a large pool of CSF between the upper neck vertebrae, okay? So this is gonna be an enormous amount, it's not a venous sinus because it's CSF, but it is, it is a huge pool of, of CSF. Now this becomes important clinically because if we want to look at something uh, like meningitis and we are worried about something called cerebral meningitis, a well-trained doctor will literally stick a needle into the uh, cisterna magna to draw CSF to see if the CSF is infected. And you're gonna see that different from what we call spinal meningitis, and how you look at that. We'll see that in a minute, okay? So we have the central canal, the foramen of Majandi, the two lateral foramen of Rablushka, and then the cisterna magna. So now, we now go into the subarachnoid space. So the, uh, there's a diffusion of CSF to the subarachnoid space, which of course is found between the arachnoid and pia matter around the spinal cord. And other than, other than the cisterna magna, there are other larger connection, uh, collections of CSF. There's the pontine and interpeduncular, which is found right at the border of the pons and the midbrain. There is a subarachnoid space enlargement around the diencephalic and optic chiasm. Then there is another collection around the corpus callosum and superior midbrain. And then there is CSF lateral to the midbrain called the ambiens. But those are larger collections of CSF. Uh, and uh, uh, here is all of these places where extra CSF can collect. So now, what we now are worried about, because we're producing 600 to 700 ml of CSF in a given day, and what we're worried about here is 
how to get rid of it because we should only have 140 ml at any given time. So now what I want you to do is imagine a very, very common thing that should be in every one of your houses. Hopefully you don't use too much of it, but a salt shaker. So you have a salt shaker and has salt in it. And now think about your salt shaker. When you turn your salt shaker upside down and you shake it, salt comes out, okay? Think in the same, that sort of general analogy that it's easy for salt to escape, but if you have all of those little openings, it's very hard to pour salt into it. So it's in some ways a more exclusively one-way street. So now let's think of the uh, arachnoid matter. The arachnoid matter separates the subarachnoid space from uh, 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 the uh, periosteal layer or the venous sinuses. So what is basically happening is the CSF, which is under a great deal of pressure because you're always making it, is literally pushing the old CSF through the uh, things called the arachnoid granulations. And you see these arachnoid granulations, especially around what we're going to see as the superior sagittal sinus when we look at venous sinuses. So an enormous amount of CSF is exiting through pressure uh, through these arachnoid granulations uh, into the superior si uh, sagittal sinus. Now, what are these arachnoid granulations? They are given two names, the arachnoid villi or the Paconian bodies. And what they are is transfer points. What they are actually are are semi-permeable cells transferring CSF from the subarachnoid space to the subdural space. From where the CSF is sitting in the subarachnoid space and pushing this old CSF out into the venous sinuses. And again, what is the semi-permeable membrane? Because that's what these things are on a larger sense. When you basically learn uh, neurophysiology neurophysio and a neuron, you basically are learning about particular ion channels for potassium and sodium that are also semi-permeable and move. This is happening on a much larger scale. So what I'm gonna do right now is get biblical on you. That is, where did CSF come from? Remember, CSF came from the arterial blood source of the choroid plexus, notably from the anterior and posterior choroidal arteries. And where is CSF exiting? It is exiting uh, into, back into the venous sinuses. So we have Genesis, the Bible, uh, three, Point 19, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt, shalt thou return. If you basically think of that interesting way of describing things, the so-called dust is the CSF came from the epithelial cells and uh, uh, of the blood supply, and the CSF then returns uh, into the venous sinuses. So, uh, so now, now what I want to consider is CSF anomalies. And the, uh, the, the, wor the worst anomaly of CSF is hydrocephalus, literally known as water on the brain. But it's not water, it's this increased amount or excess of CSF. So, there are two different forms of hydrocephalus, an external form and an internal form. An external form 
is where the excess of CSF is coming because those, uh, those um, arachnoid villi and the arachnoid granulations are not allowing the CSF to escape at its normal rate. And where does this happen? It happens most commonly in senile atrophy. So uh, among all the people in this class, I'm probably the closest person to uh, maybe coming up with, hopefully never, but uh, I could come up with an external form of hydrocephalus in which there would be excess amounts of CSF in my subarachnoid space and eventually backing up into the ventricles. Now, the other form is internal uh, CSF, uh, 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 hydrocephalus, and that is due to a dilation or an expanding of the ventricles due to the typical blocking of foramina or the cerebral aqueduct. Remember, the foramen of Monroe is a narrow channel between the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle. What would happen if we never formed the uh, foramen of Monroe? The lateral ventricles would expand and expand like a big water balloon. And what would they be, they'd be pressing against? They'd be pressing against the uh, septum pellucidum. They'd be pressing against the corpus callosum. They'd be pressing against the fornix. And they'd be pressing against the whole uh, chordate and the cortex. Or you could then have a blockage of the cerebral aqueduct. Now, all of a sudden, not only the lateral ventricles expanding, but the third ventricle expands and starts to destroy the diencephalon. Or you could have a blockage of either the foramen uh, of Majandi, the medial aperture, or the uh, 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 lateral apertures of uh, Lushka. And if you do that, then the fourth ventricle expands, the cerebral aqueduct expands, the third ventricle expands, the lateral ventricles expand, and they expand at the expense of the neural tissue. And then the last kind of uh, 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 hydrocephalus is communicating hydrocephalus, a combination of external and internal uh, hydrocephalus. So these are pretty terrible. So now one other thing that we want to go and look at is uh, that when uh, one thing you basically always want to be concerned about is if you remember the CSF was buffering against trauma, the CSF was also nutritive, and the CSF was completely clear. So what you always worry about is whether or not the CSF becomes compromised, especially around the subarachnoid space. That is if all of a sudden blood gets into the CSF. And the way you basically do this is either through a studying cerebral meningitis by doing a puncture into the cisterna magna, or you do what is called a lumbar puncture at the level of the spinal cord. Now, you might go, well, wait a second. What I remember so far and what I'm certainly going to learn is that the lumbar cord is extremely important for uh, our legs. Uh, and then the lower than that is the sacral, which is con controlling excretory function and things like that. And if I stuck a big needle into there, wouldn't I be puncturing the spinal cord right there? And the answer is, we will talk about, and you've probably learned about, that there are 31 spinal segments. Now, the way we define a spinal segment is where the sensory afferents and the motor efferents enter and exit the spinal cord. And they enter and exit the spinal cord, and I'll go into a lot more detail in a little bit, through what we call the intervertebral foramina. Uh, 
parameter is a hole, a space between each of the vertebrae, okay? And of course, the vertebrae runs all the way down into the coccyx, which is our vestigial tail. However, that is where the dorsal and ventral roots of the 31 segments go. But the spinal cord proper, the actual gray and white matter, literally ends at about lumbar section two. So what you have is the rest of the three lumbar sections plus the whole sacral section to be able to stick in a, uh, a, a lumbar puncture. And this is so common that they allow first year, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, beginning residents to do lumbar punctures. They don't do <laughs> cerebral punctures. People get a lot more training than that, but this is a relatively uh, common kind of thing. So you basically take out the, uh, uh, take out and you basically analyze the CSF for the number of white and red blood cells. And the point of the matter is how much white and red blood cells should be in CSF? Zero. Because think about a white blood cell being in CSF and then being in contact with neural tissue. That what you basically can have a very powerful neuro immune responses and white blood cells can uh, induce an enormous amount of immune types of reactions and can and, and this can very often be a very very powerful aspect of uh, of what happens in cerebral meningitis which is of course very serious so there we go and here, let's look at cerebral meningitis, basically looking at the, uh, uh, at the brain. And what you can basically see here is two very horrible holes being eaten in the brain because of cerebral meningitis on the outer layers uh, of the cortex, okay? And that uh, is the uh, end of this particular uh, lecture. So at this point, does um, anyone uh, have a, 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 a question? Oh, so I see some questions here. Is would a subarachnoid hemorrhage involve the subarachnoid matter? Yes. Uh, and uh, a subarachnoid, uh, if all of a sudden the subarachnoid space uh, it, it basically broke, what would now would basically happen is you would have um, uh, uh, you would have material coming from the venous sinuses and going and merging with the CSF. So that, of course, would be incredibly serious. Okay. Uh, professor, I do have one question. Go right ahead. It's on the last picture. I'm trying to compare it to the S to the CSF anomalies. On based on the last picture where you saw the two holes, is that considered? Well, no. The, that 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 picture was not a picture of uh, of uh, of hydrocephalus. Okay. What it was was an actual, as it was pointed out here by Annalise some type of subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, okay. that, can be, uh, that can be caused. But another aspect of this is there can be under, uh, uh, under uh, uh, rare circumstances, the introduction of blood into, uh, uh, in, in, into the CSF very often caused by some type of very, very major infection uh, you can basically look up meningitis and look at all of the various root causes of it. But in, in here, very often, the CSF now starts to contain both red and white blood cells, and that's not good. And obviously, very clearly, if, if we look at 
internal uh, hydrocephalus. And uh, very often, this is going to happen um, uh, very early in fetal development. And uh, basically, what you can end up with is an anencephalic child, simply because if you have the foramen of Monroe blocked, or you have the cerebral aqueduct blocked, or the foramina of Lushka and Majandi blocked, all of a sudden there is this buildup all through gestational development of the CSF. And then basically, if you remember the lateral ventricles are a whole telencephalon, they expand and expand and expand. And what are they doing? They're basically taking the developing cortex of the telencephalon, pushing it up against the skull and killing all of those neurons. So what you end up with is an anencephalic child, a person who may be born with neither a telencephalon or a diencephalon, obviously having very, very major uh, cognitive, emotional, any other kind of uh, pediatric deficit with a whole bunch of other deficits that very often end up with mortality within the first few months of life. Whereas the external hydrocephalus, the most common form of this being, being senile atrophy of the arachnoid villi and whatever, that is a much slower process and uh, obviously can cause uh, brain damage there as well. So, the, you know, that would then end up with a whole bunch of ischemic episodes and things like that. That would be probably uh, a form, a type of dementia, uh, which is not of the Alzheimer's type or not of the uh, Parkinsonian type. Okay. Any other question? Oh, uh, so I that. see another question. Uh, do all three meningeal layers cover the entire CNS or do some just cover the brain? They all cover the entire CS, uh, CNS. There is a, uh, a, 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 a much smaller dura matter at the level of the uh, spinal cord, but the arachnoid matter and pia matter follow the entire spinal cord and follow uh, the entire brain. So now what we're going to be looking at is that other area that sort of um, complements and interacts with what I talked about with gross anatomy by looking at uh, the superior surface, the lateral surface, the medial surface, the inferior surface of the brain. Here we looked at the ventricular system that's within it. And now what we're gonna do is look at the blood supply. And of course, if you go back to my very first slide, uh, you realize how important the blood supply is to the brain. Well, 17 to 20% of uh, glucose and oxygen are basically that are produced that are carried by arterial blood uh, basically uh, runs uh, it runs uh, 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 you know, in, uh, directly to the brain. So so here we're looking at some good old uh, fashion way of looking at things, looking at an angiogram, and looking at anterior blood supply. So one of the things that we're looking at with A down there is the aorta. And one of the major first splits coming off of the aorta is going to be the carotid artery. So B is a, a, a showing you the carotid artery, okay? C here, is showing you another artery, the vertebral artery, V-E-R-T-E-B-R-A-L. 
The carotid artery and the vertebral artery are the first and third arteries that branch off of the aorta, okay? And the aorta, of course, is carrying this uh, uh, arterial blood supply. And then what we basically see is eventually uh, that, uh, uh, that carotid artery is going to divide into an internal carotid artery. There is an external, but we're going to pay attention to the internal that goes into the uh, blood supply. And then we're going to follow uh, how the vertebral artery goes. So the first thing I want to look at is spinal arterial blood supply. So we're basically looking at what is the blood supply that's supplying the upper or cervical level of the spinal cord, then the thoracic or intercostal, the lumbar, and the sacral levels. And what we basically see here is that there are two major arteries that supply the spinal cord of blood. And the first is that vertebral artery, which I told you is the third artery that comes off of the aorta. And the second are the radicular arteries, which branch off, the, uh, branch off a little bit later. So now, uh, when we basically look at the spinal cord, what we're basically going to, uh, and we're going to see this uh, hopefully starting today, is we're going to basically, if you remember when we talked about the spinal cord, we have a dorsal surface, which is towards the back, and we have a ventral surface, which is uh, uh, towards the stomach. So the posterior spinal artery is just comes off the vertebral artery at the cervical level, and you find the posterior spinal artery medial to the dorsal roots. So what we're going to see is the major way that input comes into the spinal cord is through a group uh, 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 of cells called the dorsal root ganglion. If you remember, I used the term ganglion as a collection of nerve cells, a collection of nerve cells that are found outside of the CNS, okay? So medial to these dorsal root ganglia is the posterior spinal artery. And of course, the posterior spinal artery will vascularize the cervical level uh, through the dorsal portions of the spinal cord. Then we have an anterior spinal artery, which again is vascularizing right along the midline, the cervical cord. So now we now look at the radicular arteries, whereas the vertebral arteries at the spinal level only vascularize the cervical cord, the radicular arteries vascularize all four major levels of the spinal cord, cervical, intercostal, or thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. And again, the posterior radicular artery, again, can be found medial to the dorsal roots. So the dorsal root ganglia, which are found at the thoracic level, the lumbar level, and the sacral level, as well as the cervical level, medial to that, you would find the uh, posterior radicular artery and the anterior radicular artery, again, is at the anterior midline of all four levels. So now let's notice something, that whereas the radicular arteries vascularize the thoracic, lumbar, and sacral levels, the cervical level gets vascularized by two different arteries, the vertebral artery and the radicular artery, okay? And by the way, it gets vascularized sort of in four ways because 
There's a left vertebral and a right vertebral, a left radicular and a right radicular. So now we come to an extremely important concept that if we didn't have this, there really would not have been very much development. And that is the concept of anastomosing. What is anastomosing? What you're doing is you're taking two different arterial sources of blood and you're mixing them. You're allowing them to co-mingle. So what basically happens here? If all of a sudden the left vertebral artery got completely blocked, you would still be able to get blood supply to all four different levels of the spinal cord through the radicular artery because there is an anastomosing of blood. And where do you do this anastomosing? It's not necessarily that the two arteries then join, but what they do is they join large capillary beds and the capillary beds intermix the blood. And we're gonna be talking about this concept of anastomosing it, uh, that becomes extremely important when we get into the brain. So you have the vertebral arteries and the radicular arteries at the level of the spinal cord. So here we can basically look at uh, uh, this and uh, we can see here is the dorsal root ganglion. And what we can see is dorsal root ganglion on this side and a dorsal root ganglion on that side would be on that side. And what you see is the posterior spinal artery entering along the midline. And then we, it's, that's on uh, the posterior or uh, 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 dorsal surface. And then what you have on the anterior uh, uh, surface, you have the anterior spinal artery. And this runs all the way through all the different levels of the um, of the spinal cord. So, uh, uh, so uh, you basically see this here, uh, and here you can see the venous uh, uh, plexuses. But the important thing I want you to know is about the arterial sources into the spinal cord. So now we are going to have a brain arterial blood supply, and we're going to have four different concepts here. First is the internal carotid system, then the vertebral system, then something called the basilar system, and then the anastomosing of the blood supplies. So here is uh, here, way down here is uh, uh, the artery, I mean, uh, the aorta. And eventually, what we end up with is the carotid artery coming off. And the carotid, carotid artery then divides, whoop, then divides into on the left and right side, then divides into the external carotid artery, which of course is gonna vascularize a large portion of our face, uh, you know, our throat, uh, ears and things like that. And then a larger internal carotid artery. And the internal carotid artery runs up uh, into the lateral sulcus of the uh, of the uh, brain on the right side, and of course the left carotid artery runs into the uh, the um, on the left side. Now, if you remember, I basically said there were two other uh, 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 systems. One is called the vertebral system. So there is a right vertebral artery. And of course, 
The spinal portion of that is vascularizing the cervical cord. And then there's a left vertebral artery, which is vascularizing the, the left side of the uh, spinal cord. But then this right and left vertebral arteries come together and join the basilar artery. And they join the basilar artery right around the point at which the spinal cord ends and the, uh, the spinal cord ends and the medulla begins. And it's found on the ventral surface uh, of the brain. So it's right below the inferior surface of the brain, the basilar artery. So now what we're gonna be now interested in doing is looking at the relationship between the single basilar artery, the right uh, internal carotid artery, and the left internal carotid artery. That's what we're gonna be interested in. And we're then gonna be interested in seeing how they anastomose. So the internal carotid system on the left side and the right side give rise to six other major arteries. And they vascularize all of uh, what I would call the usual suspects in neuroanatomy. So first of all, the internal carotid system on the left and right side form the hypophyseal arteries, which vascularize the pituitary gland. The also will form the ophthalmic artery, which vascularizes the entire eyes. Then there's a little artery called the posterior communicating artery. We'll just leave it there. Then, apropos to the previous lecture about the ventricular system, the internal carotid system on the left and right give rise to the left and right anterior choroidal arteries, which of course vascularize the choroid plexus and the epithelial cells on the floor of the lateral ventricles and the roof of the third ventricle then allows uh, for the formation of CSF. Then a very major continuation of the internal carotid system is of course the middle cerebral artery, where I told you the internal carotid system sort of enters right at the base of the lateral sulcus, the middle cerebral artery continues left and right side in the lateral sulcus and then the rolandic or central sulci. And they run up continually there. So if you basically take your heart and you wanna go right up to the occiput, you basically can see that left and right uh, 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 internal carotid and middle cerebral arteries uh, just as a, a logical continuation. Then a sixth artery is the left and right anterior cerebral artery, which is found along the ventral midline. And we basically saw a wonderful space for that when we were looking at the inferior surface of the brain. And we basically saw the interhemispheric fissure not only appear on the superior surface of the brain, but run through the front, frontal poles and then run cordially on the inferior surface of the brain through the telencephalon. That ventral part of the interhemispheric fissure is going to contain the anterior cerebral artery. So there are six major arteries that come off the internal carotid system. Are these six arteries very important? Look at them. They look pretty damned important. So hopefully know them. Okay, very good. And you can see where you're getting the vascularization. 
So that was the internal carotid system. So now, like I said, the vertebral artery comes off. There's a right vertebral and a left vertebral. And right at the base of the caudal medulla, the left and right vertebral arteries merge to form the basilar artery. So now what we want to do is where we know the vertebral arteries give rise uh, 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 spinally, the basilar artery is going to give rise to a whole bunch of other arteries. And here is the vertebral system. The vertebral system, other than its spinal contribution, will vascularize the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So if we're thinking that the vertebral system is coming up this way, the first thing it's going to uh, uh, encounter is the cerebellum, and it's going to encounter the inferior surface of the cerebellum and the posterior surface of the cerebellum, hence posterior inferior cerebellar artery, left and right. Then the vertebral system anastomoses. They join into one combined system called the basilar system. And this gives rise to six more arteries. Well, cerebellum is a pretty big place. So we see the posterior inferior cerebellar artery is vascularized by the left and right vertebral arteries. The basilar system vascularizes the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. It also vascularizes the superior cerebellar artery. So you can see the entire cerebellum is vascularized by the vertebral artery before and after it joins into the basilar system. Then, of course, as we're continuing to go up, uh, there is a branch of the basilar artery that becomes the labyrinthine artery or the labyrinth in the, in the inner ear. And this vascularizes the vestibular auditory system of the inner ear. The external carotid is going to vascularize the outer surface of the ear. The pontine artery, by very definition, uh, vascularizes the pons. I mentioned the superior cerebella. And then we have the posterior cerebral artery. And just as the left and right vertebral artery join to form a basilar system, at the very rostral end of the basilar system, the, it now forms a left and a right posterior cerebral artery. So if we think about this for a second, and we think about the cerebral artery, and then we think about the gross brain and all of the lobes that we're basically talking about, we have three sources of uh, vascular, in fact, we have six sources because they're left and they're right. You have an anterior cerebral artery coming off the internal carotid, you have a middle cerebral artery coming off the internal carotid. And then you have a posterior cerebral artery left and right coming off the basilar. So that will vascularize, the. Uh, if you can figure it out, the anterior cerebral will vascularize a lot of the frontal lobe. The middle cerebral will vascularize parts of the temporal lobe and the uh, posterior frontal and anterior parietal. And then the posterior cerebral will vascularize the posterior parietal, the occipital, and the temporal. And then, as I pointed out from the last lecture, there is a second independent source of choroidal uh, 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 thing. And that's the posterior choroidal artery, which is coming off the post uh, coming off the basilar system, and that uh, vascularizes the choroid plexus. So now think about the choroid plexus for a second. 
is this huge continuum of, 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 of blood vessels that vascularize the floor of the lateral ventricles and the roof of the third ventricle. So what would happen if all of a sudden the left anterior choroidal artery got compromised? Would that mean that only that little portion would now be deprived of CSF and you would now start to have a very screwed up system? No, it's because the choroid plexus is getting blood from four different sources, the left and the right anterior choroidal and the left and the right posterior choroidal. So this commingling and mixing of blood really is an insurance against some type of insult that could compromise that system. So if it's so important for, um, if it's so important at the level of the choroid plexus, and if it's so important of the radicular and vertebral systems, anastomosing in the cervical cord, isn't it also important to vascularize probably the most important of our body, uh, of our brain, uh, uh, you know, uh, the brain and the central nervous system? And of course, here we now look at this again, and we're basically looking at how uh, the basilar system comes in, the right uh, internal carotid, and the left internal carotid. And here we're looking from uh, either side here, we basically are seeing uh, 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 the basilar system coming up the midline. And here you have a picture of the left internal carotid, the right internal carotid is not shown to vascularize. And then you're gonna have a large number of, uh, so here is the cortical branch of the right posterior cerebral. Uh, you know, and you can look at, and you can look at the middle cerebral going up over here, and the anterior cerebral would be going this way. So, uh, I'm going to answer my own question. Of course, there is a way that the left internal carotid can co-vascularize with the right internal carotid, and that the right and the left uh, internal carotid can vascularize uh, uh, with the basilar. So the internal carotid gives rise to the middle cerebral artery left and right, the anterior cerebral artery left and right, and the posterior communicating. Those were the three, three of the six major internal carotid arteries. The other three were hypophyseal, uh, ophthalmic, and anterior choroidal. But these other three become very important. And in addition to the anterior cerebral vascularizing the frontal frontal lobe on the left and right side, and the middle cerebral vascularizing the posterior frontal lobe, the superior temporal lobe, and the rostral parietal lobe left and right, there are two other important types of arteries. First of all, as I pointed out, there is a left and right posterior communicating artery. And then the two anterior cerebrals have a common joining place called the anterior communicating artery. So the anterior communicating artery connects the left and the right anterior cerebral arteries. So they will now, now allow anastomosing of blood in the uh, rostral frontal lobe. Now, the posterior communicating left and right interacts with the posterior cerebral artery left and right. If you remember the posterior cerebral arteries are the most rostral arteries of the basilar artery and they sort of uh, 
uh, come off of it and go this way. So now, what is an interesting anastomosing? What the left and the right posterior communicating arteries do is they connect the left and the right middle cerebral arteries with the left and the right posterior cerebral arteries. So we literally have this connection. And what are the implications of this? The implications are very obvious, that if all of a sudden blood is interrupted, let us say in the left internal carotid artery, way, way out there, right? Now, all of a sudden, you don't have blood running from the left internal carotid. So now the left, uh, the left anterior cerebral can't get blood, the left middle cerebral can't get blood, and the left posterior communicating can't get blood. However, because the left posterior communicating is, con is connected via the posterior uh, communicating artery, blood can go up to the left middle cerebral and then eventually into the left internal carotid and then eventually into the left anterior cerebral. Also, what can happen is if the left internal carotid is blocked, uh, you have the right anterior cerebral allowing blood to flow across the anterior communicating to allow that blood uh, to run. So you can literally do an exercise of where you would basically show where each artery gets interrupted and then how the anastomosing of the circle of Willis allows us to do. So, Okay, so here is a diagram of the uh, uh, circle of Willis. We're looking at the inferior surface of the brain. You already can identify, you know, on here, the olfactory nerve. You can see the optic nerve, the optic chiasm, the optic tract. You can see the pituitary. You can see the mammillary bodies. You can see the cerebral peduncle, you can see the middle cerebellar peduncle, and you can see uh, the pyramids. So what do you see in this brain, uh, in this picture? What you see is the left and right vertebral arteries, and you see the left and the right internal carotid arteries, you know, coming, coming up this way, and then you can see the left internal carotid artery move into the left middle cerebral, and here is the right middle cerebral. And of course, what that does is it forms the anterior cerebral artery left and right. And what you can see is running along the interhemispheric fissure is our friend, the anterior cerebral artery. And then what you have is a very small anterior communicating artery right here that literally connects the left and right anterior cerebrals. Then what you see is coming out of the left and right internal carotid is the left and the right posterior communicating. Now, let's look at that left and right vertebral artery. It joins together to form uh, the basilar artery here is the superior cerebellar artery coming off. And then the most rostral artery, right about the level of the mammillary bodies, is the left and the right posterior cerebral. So what does the left and right posterior cerebral do? Uh, or, or what can happen with it? What can happen here is the left posterior communicating artery can supply interrupted blood if the interruption was in the left middle cerebral or if the interruption was in the left uh, uh, posterior cerebral. And con uh, uh, concurrently, you have the right posterior cerebral having a connection, a blood-borne connection with the middle cerebral 
through the right posterior communicating. Then what we know, again, is that the uh, uh, anterior cerebrals have blood and you can have a connection here. So the reason why we have the term communicating artery is that the anterior communicating artery connects functionally anals and anastomosing of anterior cerebral artery blood from the left and the right side. The two posterior communicating arteries allow for the anastomosing of blood between the middle cerebral and the posterior cerebral. Now, so this is all an academic exercise, but it's real life. Why? Well, when I was a postdoc up at Columbia, the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, the Department of Psychiatry, was synonymous with another uh, structure called the New York State Psychiatric Institute, which was the major psychiatric institute for all of New York State, and it uh, and it was uh, 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 just uh, uh, identical to uh, the Department of Psychiatry at the Columbia Medical School. So uh, I got there, and um, I had just turned thirty because I had four years in the Air Force and got into. Uh, got into the thing before my 30th birthday. So I was a little age conscious. Right around the same time that I got there, they brought in the um, chairman of the Albert Einstein Department of Psychiatry, a guy by the name of Edward Sacker. And he became the head of New York State Psychiatric Institute and the chair of the psychiatry department at Columbia, probably one of the most uh, sought after places to serve uh, in, in uh, the, uh, the uh, all in academia. Why? Because a whole bunch of people who ended up serving as uh, th that may then have become uh, either the head of NIH itself, or the head of NIMH, the National Institute for Mental Health. Conversely, former NIMH heads and one NIH head then became the chair of New York State Psychiatric Institute and, um, and uh, Columbia. Ed Sacker came in there at the tender age of 38 years old. So he was a Wunderkind. And in any case, he served there until around 1980. I left in the fall of 1979. And all of a sudden, one day in his office, Ed Sacker collapsed from a stroke. I remember it's 1979. So whatever tools you had at any given time, what you couldn't basically do is basically tell what the nature of that stroke is, whether it was on the left or right side, you could see certain things. You could see it was on the left side, probably with the left middle cerebral artery because of the uh, a pare a paresis and a lack of response to the right side. And he was globally aphasic. However, whenever you have a stroke, you basically have to think about short-term uh, things of what to go and do. Now, a stroke can be caused by one of two things. What it can be caused by, on the one hand, is an interruption in the blood supply, and the interruption is caused by a block, a uh, uh, a blockage caused by uh, the artery wall itself, basically a thrombosis. And a second way of doing this is that it can be caused by an absolute opposite of that. It can be caused by a hemorrhage, a breaking of the wall. So the most 
quick way to go and treat a thrombosis is to administer to the patient, um, uh, uh, administer to the patient um, uh, uh, heparin, a blood thinner, so as to relieve the pressure. However, you recognize the fact that if the patient actually has a has a, um, a hemorrhage, what you want is coagulation. And if you give heparin, you're impeding coagulation and making the problem worse. So in any case, over a period of time, um, Edward Sacker um, basically uh, uh, had a very, very severe and profound stroke uh, of the left middle cerebral artery. And um, and it just wasn't getting better. It was a very uh, large aphasia and whatever. So of course he had to step down from his position. So over a year with intense physical, uh, uh, you know, and cognitive therapy and all of this other stuff, he was able to begin to walk again, but he had this massive stroke. So, and he had these impairments related to aphasia. So at one point in late 81 or early 82, he actually went and visited psychiatric institute and people went and saw him and everything. And after they saw him, he went uh, east over to 168th Street and Broadway, where you have a whole bunch of uh, IND and uh, uh, IRT and all of these lines converging at that spot. And he went all the way down into the D train. And he went to the very beginning of the, um, of the uh, uh, platform. So right where the train is coming in at full speed, he jumped in front of the train and he died. Obviously, all of this, he just could not take. They did an autopsy on Ed Sacker. And some people get the luck of the draw and some people do not. In a very small number of cases, the vasculature of the brain may bestow on a person a very robust left and right posterior communicating artery, and on other people, a very small or inconsequential posterior communicating artery. Ed Sacker had the latter. So what are you basically, what's basically happening there? The left internal carotid artery or the left middle cerebral got a, a, a blockage. As a result of that blockage and as a result of having a very, very small and inconsequential posterior communicating artery, the blood from the posterior communicating, uh, the, uh, 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 the blood from the po left posterior cerebral could not get up and vascularize the middle cerebral. So the stroke got bigger and bigger and bigger and the amount of time that it took to decide whether or not to give a blood thinner or not, that exacerbated the thing and produced this very powerful effect. So it, anastomosing in a lot of ways, when you go through, especially neuropsychology, what you, uh, what you very often talk about after damage is recovery of function. Here we're looking at the cardiovascular equivalent of recovery of function through the circle of Willis and through this anastomosing of blood. Okay. So now we can uh, now, now, uh, and again, whereas I think it is important for you, just like I think it's important for you to know those 12 cranial nerves and all of those attributes, 
I think it's important for you to know the six branches of the uh, internal carotid. And I also think it's important for you to know the seven branches of the um, uh, 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 vertebral basilar system. But now what I'm gonna give you, do you need to memorize these things? No, but it's a nice thing to know. And what this basically helps you do is what you should basically do is take the information from these next sets of slides and combine them with your uh, knowledge of gross anatomy to basically look at how each of the major anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, and posterior cerebral artery, then specifically vascularize particular areas. And then what you're then going to be able to see is as you look at these branches, so you have one, two, three, four, five uh, cortical branches of the anterior cerebral. You'll then look at the cortical branches in the middle cerebral and see where they anastomose at the other end, at the capillary beds. So what we have is a literal description of what we see in terms of, uh, uh, of, of gross anatomy. The medial striate artery vascularizes the chordate and putamen, it vascularizes a limbic structure to septum, and it vascularizes the internal capsule. The orbital branch of the anterior cerebral vascularizes the medial and ventral portions of the frontal lobe. The frontopolar artery, not surprisingly, vascularizes the frontal lobe, medial and frontal, the frontal pole. The coloso marginal, look at where you are. Coloso, where does that come up? The corpus callosum, so it's around that area, uh, vascularizes the singular gyrus and the ventral parietal. Then the pericolosal vascularizes the dorsal corpus callosum and the ventral parietal. And remember that if you have an insult to either the left or right, uh, anterior cerebral artery, you still have the anastomosing across the anterior communicating artery. Okay. So here we can look at the cortical branches of the anterior cerebral artery right here. And uh, you can then match it up with uh, the various uh, sub-branches to see where you go. Then the, the uh, cortical branches of the middle cerebral artery is basically really closely associated with the somesthetic, the auditory, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, speech production, and association cortex in the frontal parietal and temporal lobes. So now we have some interesting names here. The lenticulostriate artery. Well, up to now, you probably don't know what the lenticular uh, uh, system is. The lenticular system is part of the basal ganglia, uh, which is lateral to the internal capsule, and the lenticular nuclei are the putamen and the globus pallidus. The other one, the chordate, is on the medial side. So the lenticulostriate artery is vascularizing major portions of what? The basal ganglia. The anterior temporal artery obviously is vascularizing the superior temporal uh, gyrus and playing a very major role in audition. The orbitofrontal artery. So here you have the middle cerebral artery. And if you remember, we had a frontopolar artery and whatever in the anterior cerebral artery. So the orbitofrontal uh, 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 frontal artery of the middle cerebral artery will anastomose at the end point with the uh, anterior. The Rolandic artery of course, going right up 
the central sulcus, then the anterior and posterior parietal arteries, vascularizing the superior and inferior parietal lobule, and then the posterior temporal artery, vascularizing the more caudal portion of the temporal lobe. And again, you basically look at that and you can literally write next to it what would be if there was some occlusion of each of these arteries, what might be a clinical implication, both physiological and psychological. And again, what you can see is uh, the cortical branches of the middle cerebral artery, and you can compare them with the cortical branches of the uh, anterior cerebral artery. And then you can uh, look at how the middle cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery have uh, similarities. And the posterior cerebral artery has the posterior temporal artery, which is the occipitotemporal region. And of course, this is going to be important because there is going to be what? Integration of auditory stimuli and visual stimuli. Then you have the internal occipital artery, the vision, the parieto occipital artery that's going to now integrate or vascularize areas of the brain that are going to integrate somatosensory and visual. And then the uh, very important artery that we identified on the medial surface of the brain is the calcarin artery, because the calcarin artery is running right along the calcarin sulcus. And on either side of the calcarin sulcus, of course, is primar primary occipital cortex. And again, basically look at each thing, ask if something got blocked here, and what would be the clinical uh, uh, implications. And again, you can look at that there. So now, one other thing, all I'm doing here is listing these things, simply because, as I know, I probably overwhelm you. You're not going to be asked on any uh, any exam about um, uh, uh, cerebral veins, but what we basically want to think about is when we think of a vein, when we think of any kind of cell, what we basically think about is material that's arterial, that's bringing in the glucose, and it's bringing in the oxygen, and it's bringing in the electrolytes, and then venous. Uh, things are basically pulling the things away and bringing it and clearing it through the liver and the kidneys and whatever in order to, again, make arterial blood. But the interesting thing about our skull, and because things flow downhill, basically what we're always looking at is a very, very, uh, uh, the major way of output, of venous output, of course, is the left and right jugular veins. And of course, a vein, because of its uh, size, uh, has an elasticity to it. It's usually larger, and the flow of the blood going through veins is far, far slower and lower than the flow of blood going through arteries, which are much thinner, and of course, uh, have the pressure of basically moving upward. So here we, in a lot of ways, because of uh, 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 the horizontal structure of our uh, heads, is we're using the venous sinuses as sort of reservoirs of venous blood. Uh, so you have the superior cerebral veins between the dura and the arachnoid matter. And this sort of brings me back in time, back into the um, late 1960s, in which they started to have medical dramas on TV. And there were two major medical dramas. One was this sort of blonde-haired, blue-eyed, chip, chipper guy named Dr. Kildare. And of course, they have um, probably a million shows that had a Dr. Kildare kind of uh, 
of, uh, of, uh, of a guy. He's very empathetic. He talks to the patients. He does this and he does that. And then they had a second guy played by an actor named Vince Edwards. Vince Edwards had dark black hair. He had a big bushy black eyebrows and he had a perpetual scowl on his face. And of course, what did Vince Edwards play? He played a guy named Ben Casey, who was a neurosurgeon. And for about 97% of all of the shows, what would happen where a patient came in and was presented to Ben Casey? Well, Ben Casey would check the guy out and then he'd shake his head very, very thin. You have a subdural hematoma. And what is that? Think of subdural. The area between the dura matter and the arachnoid matter is the peri periosteal layer. And you have the venous sinuses in there. Hema means blood. Toma is a huge clot. So now this, this blood that is in this superior cerebral vein is not moving. And now, instead of when we think of hydrocephalus, the subarachnoid space expanding and pushing the brain down, the subdural hematoma is now collecting an enormous amount of blood and pushes up against the skull and then pushes up against the brain. So there is, a, so, uh, there is a very common form of subdural hematoma in which basically you have to relieve that pressure. Then we have the superficial middle cerebral vein, the deep middle cerebral vein, the internal cerebral vein, the subcortical veins, and all of these drain into sinuses and drain into um, uh, 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 going downward and downward and downward until we get to the jugular vein. And here are the final venous sinuses that when we look before, when we were looking at the, um, uh, uh, the base of the skull with the ventricular system, here are the venous sinuses, the torcular herophili, that empties into the foul cerebri and all of these uh, empty. So what you can basically do is get um, uh, you know, a picture of this and just basically see where each of these things are. And in each case, if there is some type of hematoma at any one of these sinuses, it can present itself uh, negatively. Okay. So now, what are the major ways that we can disturb blood supply and then all of the particular blood supplies that we basically discuss? And the first is a thrombosis. And a thrombosis is formed by a thrombus which blocks the artery. In most of the cases, it is a buildup of it's a buildup of uh, the wall. And basically what you have right here is a buildup of cholesterol. So again, uh, many people my age, I take it each day, is a statin which reduces the amount of cholesterol and hopefully reduces the probability of a physical wall-like barrier gone across the artery that will either severely reduce the blood flow or actually stop the blood flow. Now, what is an aneurysm? Well, what an aneurysm is, is that if you have a, um, if you have either a partial uh, thrombosis or a full thrombosis, the blood, which is keeping on coming, will come, can't pass or pass very slowly. And what basically happens to that area 
proximal on that blood vessel is that uh, an aneurysm is a swelling of the blood vessel and it gets larger and larger and larger. And of course you can have uh, cerebral aneurysms in which uh, there is this large uh, uh, thing, or you can have other kinds of aneurysms in which the aneurysm actually has the blood now flow in two different directions rather than one. So um, here, what you can basically see is an internal carotid artery going into the middle cerebral artery, and you can see the blood flowing, and you can see the blood flowing into the anterior cerebral artery. But here you have this aneurysm, which is caused by a thrombosis and then a swelling of, uh, of the uh, proximal portion of this and look at what happens to the amount of blood flow that goes uh, after that. It is either absent or severely reduced. And then of course, borrowing from Edward Munch, uh, we have a thing called a brain hemorrhage. And in a brain hemorrhage, now all of a sudden, instead of an aneurysm, which is the ballooning, instead of a thrombosis, which is the block, a hemorrhage is actually a break in the blood vessel wall. And now blood is now flowing out of the arterial source and literally flowing and flooding into the surrounding tissue. And if it's neural tissue, it's taking up space. So two different things happen. One, where the blood was supposed to go is not getting there. So the, that, uh, that distal portion is getting what? Uh, deprived of blood. But then secondly, proximal to the hemorrhage is a place where all of a sudden now you have a flood of liquid that very often can coagulate and collect and literally start to literally and physically displace brain tissue. And at that point, uh, you have a major, um, you know, a, a major event that you have to uh, basically put a stent in to relieve the pressure, et cetera, et cetera. And here is a very nice example of a very large hemorrhage looking at a horizontal section of the brain and you can see uh, a, a, a large amount of damage here. Here's a hippocampus on either side. So what we're basically looking at is either the ventral, um, uh, we're looking at the uh, 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 either the ventral parietal lobe or the superior temporal lobe and right along here, you have the insula. So uh, you have uh, a, a damage on the left side of the brain and whatever functions that are happening on this side of the brain are being compromised because of that hemorrhage. So that is the, um, that is the second and third um, things. So I see I have some uh, questions. Oh, I see. You should see some of the hematomas from UFC fighters. Oh, I can just imagine. Where's uh, Christopher? <laughs> Why do you see that? Uh, it's Christian, but yeah, there's one person in particular. I mean, it looked like she turned into an alien. I mean, the, they're crazy. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, look, uh, 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 I was, uh, uh, I was born in 1946. So when I was a young teenager, this unbelievable guy comes into the 1960s Olympics. One of the first things that was ever, uh, um, uh, you televised and you watch this young fighter named Cassius Clay with the real speed and everything like that and the loud mouth and boom, he wins the uh, 
uh, uh, uh, becomes the Olympic champion. And of course, over the next few years, converted to Islam and became Muhammad Ali. And probably, I still think, I guess I'm biased, you know, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the saying, hey, boomer? You know, boomers always have the most important people, I guess. Well, at least for me, uh, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali was this interesting person. And then, of course, in the 1980s, started to come down and uh, eventually died from Parkinson's disease. And he obviously died, from, died probably from multi-infarct dementia. So uh, just a horrible uh, kind of things. Then would you like us to be able to identify the anatomical layout of the vasculature or just knowing what vascularizes what is enough? Okay. There are short-term ideas and long-term ideas. Your short-term idea, obviously, is to get a good grade in this class. And I basically told you that among my usual sub su suspect types of questions is what are the uh, six arteries of the, uh, uh, of the uh, internal carotid? What are the seven uh, arteries of the um, basilar? And then how does the internal carotids and the basilar uh, uh, interact with one another, obviously the circle of Willis. However, if you want to do neuroscience and you become interested in very specific parts of the brain and you recognize, yes, you might have a tumor that goes there or something like that, the largest, uh, the most common, especially in human beings, that, uh, that impacts whatever area of the brain you're in is some type of vascular insult. So eventually, you want to put these things sort of together. And this is not a bad, I'm not asking you to memorize it, but really start to get a picture. What I'm hoping you're doing by this third lecture is between the ventricular system and where that is and how it interacts with the various lobes, and then the arterial system, where it vascularizes and how it vascularizes, you're starting to get, I hope, a three-dimensional picture of what the brain is looking at. One thing you have realized so far uh, that probably all of you are chomping at the bit, oh, when is he going to show an fMRI? Guess what? I'm never going to show you an fMRI. Of course, all an fMRI is, is, a, is a, a, a digitalized version of the brain. I want you to learn the brain well enough so that now when you look at an fMRI, you can now identify without those people telling you, oh, it's the this, you can identify things. Okay, and that becomes the very, very important kind of thing. And then not only identify it structurally, but then identify it functionally. And now armed with the ventricular system and the blood supply, you see major reasons why you may end up with uh, uh, particular uh, insults. So let me just see if there was some Yes, I, I'm terrible at type. The way I type is with my two fingers and people say I type pretty fast with it, but I do make mistakes. It's, anast it's, anastom it's anastomosing, not anastomosing. Thank you. Okay, okay, very good. Well, I, I answered that. So, Oh, here we go. Curious. On the top of vessel blockages, ruptures, would an anterior cerebral artery be more associated with Broca's aphasia? And uh, would a, I guess so, but let's face it. When you have uh, these kinds of things, you very often don't get a punctate 
thing of just the middle and the anterior. And by the way, even if you did, think about a thrombosis in the left middle cerebral artery. What is that going to do? It's not only going to deprive uh, the area distal to that, but the area proximal to that is going to start to build up and build up, and it's going to have effects on the anterior cerebral artery. And very often, a lot of these, uh, 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 again, you can probably go and look at an epidemiology of strokes and, and, and whatever. Uh, where do most start? Do most start in the internal carotid or do most start in the middle cerebral, et cetera, et cetera. But very often, we will have, uh, 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 we only picked up uh, Broker and Wernicke because they were interesting individual case studies of a highly specific aphasia. Most people will have a general aphasia, both things simply because multiple blood supplies are being affected. Okay? Okay. Okay. So uh, there we go with that. And does anybody have any further questions? So what I'm going to ask you to do this week is not only mull over what you just learned here, but begin to put all of the various things together, the gross anatomy with the blood supply, with the ventricular system. In the next class, we're going to start the spinal cord. And uh, we'll basically march through the spinal cord, uh, 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 you know, anatomically, layer by layer, uh, going through, first of all, its organization, and then going from the sacral cord all the way up to the cervical cord. And then what we'll do is start to go through the major um, uh, uh, spinal projection systems that are both ascending and descending. And when I do that, I will then have functional lectures on specific things like uh, a somesthesis, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So let me put it this way in case people are worried about an ex uh, exams. We're probably, we're going to spend at least the next two lectures on the spinal cord then I'd probably give a lecture on the medulla, and I wouldn't be giving the exam that week asynchronously. I'd be probably giving it a little bit after. So I'm give, I'm, I want to give you people enough time to digest and figure this out, and I'm going to talk a little bit further as we go along with what the nature of the exam will be and how I'll deliver it and get feedback from all of you. Okay, so again, I apologize. Given the craziness of this week, what I will probably do is send all of you a uh, invitation with a new schedule uh, next week, so we can go on and we don't um, uh, we don't start late. Okay, so again, thank you. Have a good week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, thank you.